You're listening to the Fierce Fatty Podcast, episode 110. How to cope with weight gain and feeling uncomfortable in your body. Let's do it! Perfect! I'm Victoria Wellesby, TEDx speaker, best selling author, and fat activist. I have transformed my life from hating my body with desperately low self-esteem to being a courageous and confident, fierce fatty who loves every inch of this jelly. Society teaches us living in a fat body is bad, but what if we spent less time, money and energy on the pursuit of thinness and instead focused on the things that actually matter, like if pineapple on pizza should be outlawed or if the mullet was the greatest haircut of the 20th century. So how do you stop negative beliefs about your fat body controlling your life? It's the Fierce Fatty Podcast. Let's begin. fatties hey fat allies thanks for tuning in i need to update my um intro outro whatever it is with my name victoria on my god there's so so many places i'm like that you have your name right it's annoying anyway i share today on instagram about my new name Vinny. if you haven't um heard about that so far because i'm non-binary and I had so many nice comments. It was very nice. And a lot of people, um, well, a lot of people saying, hello, welcome, welcome to the world. Welcome your debut as Vinny. And uh, that was really cool. One person said actually that um, they realize that they are, I think they said um, asexual. Uh, let me just check. An asexual is someone who doesn't have um, sexual attraction to others or could be either reduced or um, not as much and there's also like gray sexual so I guess that that would be the not as much um, and let me see I pinned the comment I pinned the comment why is it not showing here um, yeah anyway uh, and they said uh, a little part of uh, that journey um, was listening to the podcast which is amazing because I've never mentioned um, asexuality but I guess hearing about my experience of uh, understanding my non-binary identity, I guess, kind of cross o- crosses over into different things. Um, so that was really cool to hear. Thank you for sharing. Um, and it's something I wanted to clear up. Something I wanted to clear up. I wanted to clear up something. Okay, <laughs> so on my post. On my post, I wrote that um, Canadians don't do nicknames. I went in and edited it to say Canadians don't tend to do nicknames, especially in the workplace, um, because this is what I mean. OK, so in the UK, especially with a name like Victoria, where there's, where there's there's lots of nicknames. Actually, in Canada, you don't do the nicknames with Victoria, really. There's no kind of Vicky or Vic or whatever. Anyway, whatever. And I know there's I know that's not a kind of a blanket statement of all Canadians. Well, maybe that's what it sounds like, a blanket statement. Um so in, in England, in the UK, say, and it would be in work settings, they, you'd say, oh, yeah, I'm making an application. You put your name as Victoria and then they'd go for the interview and you'd, they'd say, oh, what do you go by? And then you'd be like, oh, Vinny, what do you go by? You'd be like, oh, whatever, whatever. Or, or just Victoria, if you just wanted to be Victoria, if you were a Victoria. Um, but yeah, it would be kind of like a, oh, what do you go by sort of thing, especially with a name like Victoria, where there are lots of different kind of not lots, a few, <laughs> more like one, one Vicky or Vic. <laughs> um, yeah, and so in Canada, I just thought the it'd be the same where, you know, I got my first job and the boss didn't say, what do you go by? The colleagues didn't, my colleagues didn't say, what do you go by? And I was like, well, shit, I don't want to tell them that my name's Vinny because I don't want them to think that I'm pr- unprofessional, you know, or think that that was unprofessional because I thought, you know, well, having a nickname is unprofessional because people are not asking me in the workplace and no other workplace ever. And I've been in Canada for 12 years. I guess I was in like corporate type jobs for Mm. Eight, eight of tw- eight of twelve years. Anyway, and so it's just it's more of I think a more of a British thing to say. You know what do you go by? Um, 
And so people were saying in the comments, oh, I call my nieces and nephews or I call my kids nicknames. And yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. It's not like Canadians don't know the concept of nicknames. <laughs> of course they do. Of course you do. It's just a different, a change in the way that you, the you, my experience in the UK and my experience in Canada. And that's just my experience. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Good. Because I guess, you know, in the past I've said this on the podcast and maybe some Canadians were listening being like, that's not true, that's not true. And, and obviously I didn't explain as clear as this. And then maybe it's not true. Maybe people do say, and I've just never experienced it, of what do you go by? You know, or do you have a nickname in, in work situations or, or, or personal situations? I mean, more likely in per it's more likely in personal situations, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, so about half an hour ago, I made my very first appointment at Big bros barbershop in vancouver big bros barbershop is um let me see i'm going to tell you what they are from looking at their website big bros barbershop in Van is vancouver's beauty and resource center for the trans community and beyond all types of folks are welcome here so i can't wait i can't wait um because you know what my hair has been a source of a source of dysphoria a source of feelings for me and uh, I, I remember I was going to that hairdresser and they kind of they said oh you're a new woman and I and I told them about being non-binary and blah, 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 learning all that type of stuff and it just feels that that hairdresser didn't get it you know I don't know so anyway, so I'm going to this place and we'll see how it goes. I'm going there next week. I'll let you know how, how the experience was. And um, it's really fucking cool. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I, I'd known about this place because they were, they were looking for donations previous. I knew about them because they were looking for donations of plus size clothes because they um, would provide clothes. I don't think they do that anymore. And so I knew about this place. And then Summer Inanen said to me, oh, why don't you go to Big Bro's Barbershop? And I was like fucking hell <laughs> why hadn't i thought of that oh my goodness um yeah so that's pretty cool so if you're if you're struggling with this type of stuff see check out in your local area if there's anything like that or if if maybe if there's like a uh, a gender non-conforming non-binary trans hair stylist hairdresser that's working just for a an average salon that might that might help yes and finally, another little update for you. Did you know, did you know, I mentioned it a few few episodes ago, but I wanted to let you know that the podcast, the Fierce Valley Podcasts now has transcripts for every single episode. Um, and we're doing the backlog. And so my team are doing two every week from the backlog. So let's say we started, I don't know, five, six, seven, let's say 10 episodes ago. So that's a hundred. So it's going to take a year. It's going to take a year. We do two a week to get through the black backlog of a hundred. That's okay. You know, cause that's, that's what we're, what we're able to do at the moment. And actually I think the first, no, that's that. Cause I think the first number of episodes we were able to do transcripts, but then it got way too expensive. Good thing about all this new technology is things are always changing and things are getting like way more accessible and way more affordable for just, you know, um, a small business like me to be able to provide transcripts as standard. Whereas even just a year ago, it was cost prohibitive for me. Well, even not even just a year ago, like a matter of months ago, it was cost prohibitive for me to provide transcripts for every single episode. Um, and considering my episodes are normally about 45 minutes an hour long, um, yes so now it's you can get transcripts for just you know uh you just pay a flat rate for x amount of minutes a month and yeah so and it's really cool because 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 you can listen to you can either just read the the pdf or you can listen to it on this platform it's called otter on this platform where um you press play and it will go the words will go along with the audio um so that was really that's really cool um yeah and it's and it's pretty accurate it's pretty good it's pretty good um yeah so today we are talking about we're talking about this topic of um 
it's a topic that I, I see quite a lot, actually. So I, I do, I do. obviously, we have Fierce Fatty Academy, I do coaching there. Also, I do coaching in, in other people's programs. And so nutritionists, dietitians, uh, coaches, when they want someone who is um, really fucking cool like me, a fat person to come in to talk about, you know, fat phobia and weight stuff. Because a lot of people... Um, it just goes hand in hand, right? If you're doing intuitive eating, you are going to come up against fat phobia, as in your own fat phobia, and depending on your size, um, fat phobia from, from the rest of the world directed at you, or fat phobia from the rest of the world that you're absorbing. And uh, that is difficult. So um, the, the kind of general question that I see quite often is, I keep going into spirals, negative thought spirals, uh, around my weight and it's worse now because since starting intuitive eating or recovering from my eating disorder I've gained weight so um, a lot of people get stalled on their journey really stuck on their journey because um, they get really excited and we're going to start this intuitive eating who knows what's going to happen I'm going to you know I'm, I'm work, working on my recovery who knows what's going to happen maybe I'll lose weight maybe I'll lose weight and then we don't know what's going to happen in regards to your weight you know and if you do put on weight then it's kind of like holy shit how can I how can I cope with this it's very very difficult and coping with it and dealing with it is um, it's complex, right? Because you've probably lived in a society that demonizes um, fat bodies for many years. If you're, if you're, uh, if you're in this place of uh, trying to unlearn it, then you pro that's probably true for you. Um, and so let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Um, so some of the things I notice, some of the things that come up for me when we think, when I think about this, is that this is so hard. This is so hard and painful. And I want to extend massive empathy for, if this is your situation for you right now, if you have experienced weight gain, um, especially if you are, are trying something new like intuitive eating, um, or if anything else is going on in your life. I mean, fuck, if you're a human being, then you've got other things going on in your life. So it's difficult at any point. Um, and, so, you know, being fat or fatter in this society is seen as a massive failure. And the reality is that life can be a lot harder, and it most likely is, for fat folks. And even more so, the higher weight you are. And that is due to structural, institutional, interpersonal and ideological fat phobia. So you have your own difficult thoughts to deal with. And you have society echoing your deepest fears. And then if you have a fat body, you're not only seeing them like spoken to you through the way the society uh, you know, talks about fat bodies, but you're experiencing that too. And so if you have put on weight and gone from someone who's straight size to someone who's fat, it, it, really, really difficult. Or if you've gone from someone who is, is a smaller fat person or a medium fat person into a larger fat person or a super sized fat person, infinity fat person, that can be very, very difficult. One thing I do want to want to say that I notice is that often when people are talking about their own weight gain, they actually haven't gained that much weight. Obviously, this is not a not everyone. Some people do gain um, more than you know just a little bit of weight. And I mean, oh my goodness, when I was when I was in diet culture, I remember putting on oh, five pounds. And I was devastated. <laughs> oh my goodness. I was devastated that I was, had put on, you know, it was a very small lump, very small number. And to me, that was huge. Like, I mean, fucking hell, five pounds. Well, that, that's like a fucking going for a shit, isn't it? Like five pounds. <laughs> really, it's not a lot. But in my mind, five pounds was the difference between my boyfriend dumping me or not, you know, five pounds was the difference in me being seen as hot and sexy and attractive. And five pounds was the difference between failure and the difference between being a good person. The reality was no one could see that I had put on five pounds. No, there's no way, but I was stressing about it. And so that's one thing I want to kind of point out is that sometimes when we're in it, five pounds, 10 pounds, whatever, 
20 pounds can feel insurmountably huge, but that is not necessarily the reality. I mean, to you, it can feel, and it, it, I mean, it is, and it's not that you're making up your feelings around it, that whatever you're feeling around it is absolutely true that you're experiencing those, those difficult feelings, but to other people, it might not even be perceptible, you know? So is it, is it true that, you know, you're going to go and see your friends and family or, uh, you know, bump into someone on the street and they're going to go, holy fucking shit whoa, you know, you, you, you've put on so much weight or thinking that in their mind. Maybe, maybe not, you know, but, um, is it just like, it's a small amount of weight and really, um, you're not going to have to deal with changes in the way that people, uh, changes in the way that society treats you and people treat you. And of course it could be that you, yes, you have put on, um, a noticeable amount of weight and that's okay too like that's okay you know but, but I just want to point out that sometimes our brains fuck with us you know <laughs> sometimes uh, you know something doesn't fit and then all of a sudden it's like oh my god I must be so I must have put on so much weight and even if you're not weighing yourself or even if you do, if you are weighing yourself stop that um, even if you are weighing yourself then it feels like it's 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 a lot of a lot of weight and um, a lot of times it's not actually. And, th and so if you have, even, even if you've put on, you know, a little bit of weight or a lot of weight, it's distressing for a lot of people. And at the beginning of weight gain, especially if we've, if we've gained um, a noticeable amount of weight, either in our, in our bodies, the way they feel or the way that they look, um, it can be very distressing because it's a new feeling. It's a new observation if you can see a difference in the way that you look or if you notice your body for example um i started started noticing um my arm just a feeling of more kind of flesh on my arm i don't know if there was more flesh but i just i just was like noticing it and it was it it drew my attention to it if i was not in a good place then that could be me spiraling down into holy shit I need to die I need to blah 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 um but it, it's noticeable no matter what in regards to you'll you'll see the difference if there is a difference um and if you are struggling with this stuff then that's when noticing a change can turn into holy shit oh my god you know I'm bad I'm unattr unattractive I need to forget about this intuitive eating stuff blah 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 and it's kind of like I think about I think about I think about the first time I I got my hair cut my mum suggested I get a bob and I thought that she was saying bomb b-o-m-b -B, this new haircut and it was called a bomb and bomb wasn't like saying something was bomb wasn't wasn't a thing back when I was young but um <laughs> she was like it's called a bomb and I was like fuck yeah I want a haircut that's a bomb and uh it was actually a bob and I had really thick hair I do have really thick hair and I had long hair at the time and it went into being a bob and the next morning I woke up I remember this so clearly waking up we had a mirror in our bedroom um, sitting up in bed, looking to the side and seeing that I had a bob, bomb, bomb haircut and being like, holy shit, <laughs> and putting my hands through it and uh, being like, where's all my hair gone? You know this feeling if you've had your hair cut, any big haircut, kind of like, oh, this is so strange. And then, you know, however long it took to become normal, then it's normal, you know? Um, and that's just hair. And obviously hair can be very emotional, but... Uh, imagine if it was something more more loaded like weight then it's kind of going to be like oh my god but it will ease it will ease it will become less distressing as, as, especially if you do the stuff that I'm going to be talking about um, shortly um, and I like to think about as well like what if I was suddenly plonked into the body of a human who had like dick and balls. Like if I was plonked into the body of a, a human that had dick and balls, I'd be like, 
what? This is so strange. I'm sitting here and there's this thing between my legs and oh my goodness. And like, you know, obviously spent hours doing the helicopter with my new dick and balls. The balls don't do the helicopter, do they? It's just a dick. No, you hold the dick, you hold the balls down. Obviously expert in doing helicoptering on my imaginary dick. Um, <laughs> and it would be strange, right? A few months down the road, you're going to get used to it. So this this has got this ridiculous <laughs> ridiculous example, and as well, I think about if a thin person was magically uh, teleported into my body, that would be really difficult for them because then they'd they'd be like, oh my goodness, I feel this this belly here, just I feel this belly up against the table here, and before there was no belly, I feel my my thighs are touching, and I can feel my belly touching my legs, and I can feel my back rolls, and I can feel, and it would be very strange for them to feel that. And so um, it's normal for you to to notice it. And it could be just, you know, physically or in the mirror or whatever it is. Um, it, it will be strange and it will ease with time, hopefully. Obviously, I don't want to say every, for everyone it will ease, but um, let's do some work towards trying to get that to ease. Something else that comes up for me when I'm thinking about this is it's really nice to believe that we have control over our bodies, right? Like that's what we've most of, most of society has always believed that we have control over our bodies and we have control over our weight. And when this this uh, these 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 thoughts about our bodies, these negative spirals that we could go into, our brain is saying, even though logically we know the reality, our brain is kind of like, yeah, but if you really wanted to, you could become thin and end all of this pain. And if you just just, restri just restrict a little bit, just do it a little, a little bit, just eat a little bit less and maybe don't eat that thing. Maybe just go out for an extra workout. Just just do it a little bit so you, you get a little bit thinner and it'd be no big deal, no problem. And so one part of our brain is saying this, like, you have control. You can make a couple of small changes. No big deal. No big deal. Obviously, this is like diet diet talk in our brains. This is not the reality. Um, and how intoxicating is it to believe that we have control? That if I just, I don't feel good right now. And if I just became thin, not only would I feel better, but I get all of these other benefits, some real, some imagined. Still never got that call from Brad Pitt. Actually, I don't want Brad Pitt to call me. You know what? I always say Brad Pitt, but <sighs> who would I like to call me? What celebrity would I like to call me up on the phone and tell me I'm a wonderful person? Oh, I know. I'm watching, I'm watching Band of Brothers HBO right now, again, for the second time. That matey that's in The Punisher, John... Berenthal? Yeah. Yeah, I'll have a bit of him. Yeah, that's just on my mind. Anyway, John Berenthal, if that's, if that's your name and you're listening, not likely. <laughs> Give me a call. Tell me you want to be um, my friend. Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah. So real, real, real or imagined, because of course you do get a shit ton of privilege and good stuff that comes with having a smaller body. Um, but also it's not going to make you necessarily happy and all of those things, you know, life amazing because you're, you have a smaller body. So you've got this kind of, oh, but I, I know I've tried becoming thin most of my life and it didn't work for me. And then you've got the other side being like, yeah, but you know, you can, you know, you can. And the thing is, we all can lose weight theoretically, but we can't keep it off because our bodies are fucking amazing. And they're like, bitch, what are you doing? Why are you putting me through this again? Hello, just eat some food, you loser. Um, and then we're like, shut up, Bonnie. I just want to be thin. So John Barenthal will call me. Um, but yeah, we all know, we know, we know, we know. We know this. But that illusion of control and blaming yourself like it's my fault it's my fault I'm feeling like this because if I was just a better person if I was not so lazy if I was not such a disgusting person I would be thin and that's not true right so 
if you put on your if you put on weight your pro your body probably needed it right it's probably that you weren't eating enough food before it's probably your body saying oh thank god they're finally listening to me they're f all of these years i've been begging them and pleading with them to 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 notice me and to to give me a reliable source of food to to rest me when we're exhausted and oh thank fuck they're finally listening to me this is what your body is saying and that is the weight gain is is something that your body just needed to do for whatever reason and so why are we then kind of punishing ourselves for our body doing exactly what it needs to do also curious about this question were you hoping that intuitive eating or recovery or whatever else would make you thin secretly i know i did i was like yeah 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 yeah, yeah. we don't know what's going to happen with someone's weight when they do intuitive eating but I can kind of tell that I'm going to be the person that is, uh, happens, my natural body weight is probably going to be like supermodel. So I better get ready to run the catwalks this time next year because with intuitive eating, I'm going to be thin as fuck. Um, but secretly, secretly, <laughs> secretly, I wouldn't have said that, you know, out loud. But, you know, probably I'm the type of person to lose weight on intuitive eating because, you know, I'm going to do it so good and I'm going to really be really intuitive when I eat, which means that I'll become thin. Um, so was that you? You probably, right? You're probably, yeah, guilty. And that is still me, guilty kind of thing. Um, and that's okay, you know, because obviously the hope that uh, you might accidentally become thin through this, this new thing that you're trying. And then the reality is maybe you don't become thin because who knows what your body is going to do. Um, it's so disappointing. It's so disappointing for a lot of people. And so with that, you need to work on your beliefs around thinness, what thinness means and what fat phobic beliefs that you hold because you will, because you're human, hold fat phobic beliefs. And the way that I see it is when we're having these uh, experiences where, oh my goodness, I'm just in this spiral of, oh, if I only I was thin, I should lose weight. Oh my goodness, I've put on weight. This is awful. Um, even though that sucks, it's actually a really good um, indicator of, of where we need to be focusing our work. So it just goes to show you've got, um, your brain has very kindly pointed out to you, hey, I still kind of believe that being thin would mean that um, my boyfriend will think that I'm super hot and he will probably propose, you know, and la 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 la. I was like, okay, okay, great. Thank you, brain, for, for illuminating that thought for me. Let's dig into it. Let's see if that is true. Let's get curious. So if you have gained a perceptible amount of weight, or even if you haven't, but you're struggling with this stuff, um, we need to learn how to, one, build resiliency around shame through curiosity. And two, work out how to self, self soothe. So let me, let me say that again. If you're struggling with this stuff, we need to learn how to one, build resiliency around shame through curiosity and two, work out how to self soothe. So you're like, Victoria, great, easy peasy lemon and lime you're thinking no <laughs> well, how do you do that how do you do that um well it's you know it's going to be different for every person but there are there are certain things that that i i appreciate and work that i've been doing recently with my therapist uh i've been in therapy for years and years and i will be in therapy for the rest of my life because i think therapy is what fucking amazing and something that i have been dealing with is um shame 
me feeling shame. Oh, it's so much fun. Don't we love shame? And I did that Brené Brown course on, on shame and, um, oh, shame. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, what? I've been, I've been dealing with a lot of shame around, um, that, that TV show that I did. I did a TV show a few years ago and just still working on overcoming the things that happened there. And then part of it, shame is coming up right now. Oh, why are you still talking about this? This is what my shame is saying. Why, why aren't you over this by now? It's not like they abused you. It's not like uh, it wasn't like when you were in an abusive relationship when you were younger. It's not like when you were homeless. Why are you still... Yeah, so shame, <laughs> shame, is, shame is right there at the surface. Thank you. Thank you, shame. Um, anyway, and so uh, what the work that I'm doing with my therapist is on internal family systems and parts work. And so this is a, this is a newer concept to me. Um, but I have been doing things like this for a long time but I just didn't even know I you know this is just what has worked for me and I didn't even know that there was a name to it you know and that is talking to or or getting curious about the thoughts that you're having so let me give you a really very basic idea so the idea is that there this is because I'm new to this so I'm not an expert at all okay but the idea is that there's different um parts of you anger or sadness or fear or happiness or whatever um there's different parts and they are they're on a bus they're on a bus i asked my therapist last time did you come up with this bus thing or was that me and she said it was her but her through the you know the this work you know um and they're on a bus and when you're happy your i don't know true self or your authentic self or your evolved self or just you you're the one driving the bus and everyone's in their seats where they need to be and um from time to time shame will get up and be like i'm gonna be driving the bus now and you won't even realize it and so shame will be driving the bus and being like listen up here everyone remember that time in 1996 when you were uh, kicked your sister and uh you were just such a piece of shit then wasn't wasn't you oh remember that time when uh this and oh you were such a loser and you don't even realize it right and then it, the parts work is identifying that this is another part of me that's talking and they're not a bad part. It's just just a part of being a human, right? Is that we experience shame. We need to experience shame for to to make sure that we're not doing stupid shit, right? But most of the shame that we're feeling is shame that we don't need to feel. Um, so just identifying that shame is in the driver's seat, anger is in the driver's seat, happiness is in the driver's seat, just, you know, whatever. Um, someone is in the driver's seat for me, that is just so powerful. When I notice I'm in some type of thought spiral and I'm just like, oh, remember the time that you, da 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 da, whatever, um, then just saying to myself, oh, sounds like shame is driving the bus. That can be really helpful. Obviously, that doesn't work all the time because then I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because you need to feel ashamed. You need to feel ashamed of the shit that you've done. Um, so then what, what I'll do is, um, is something that my, my therapist shared with me, which is called unblending. And so unblending is kind of when you're, when you're so in that emotion, you're just, you just in it, you just feel it, you agree with it. You know how, um, I was talking about how, uh, one part of your brain is like, we know that we can't lose weight. We know we don't have control over our brain. We know. And then the other part is like, yeah, but just do it. Nah, 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 nah. And it's like, we can't lean into that more wise thoughts because we're in, we're in those shame thoughts. And so unblending is kind of getting you into 
the other side, the kind of wise thoughts. Like, what would you say? If your friend was sat there right now and they were having the exact same thoughts, what would you tell them? Your friend said, hey, listen, um, I'm really struggling. I've put on weight and I'm thinking that I'm a piece of shit, that I'm unattractive, that I should go on another diet, that I'm a failure, that da, 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 da. Would you say, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. All your worst fears, it's true. In fact, I don't like you and you should definitely go on another diet. In fact, never eat anything ever again. Like, no, even if you hate your friend, you wouldn't say that. But, um, and so what we're trying to do is trying to be that friend. But really, we know how to, we know what we would say, right? We know all of these rational things. And so these are the steps of unblending. So this is from my, my therapist. So one, assume that the distressing or uncomfortable feeling is communication from a part of you that's been triggered. So we assume shame is shame is in the driver's seat number two put the parts feelings into words like this anxious part is really scared or they feel worried that see what happens if you speak for the part by naming the feeling as theirs and so um the other week i was in a shame spiral i was in bed and i was like crying because I was like I'm such a loser and so I, I sat up and I imagined shame version of Victoria sat next to me and I put my hand out and I imagined that I was holding my hand shame shame me holding my hand and in my head um actually no I spoke it out loud um but you can do it in your head whatever and it might be that doing it like this is, doesn't work it might that you need to just write it out on a piece of paper um or whatever works for you or this this might not work at all right i'm just giving you some ideas uh saying what's going on what's going on and then um and then i would reply shame shame victoria shame Vinny replies oh, i just feel so embarrassed that this and i feel like i shouldn't have said that and da da da, da. and then i responded the wise version oh, yeah i bet that sounds so difficult and wow no wonder you would feel ashamed and then carry on the conversation um yeah so number three try to create a little more separation from the parts by sitting back from their feelings changing position lengthening your spine so that you can both feel both them and you other examples might be feeling your feet or taking some deep breaths noticing a more neutral feeling in your body so that's why I sat up, kind of like getting out of that position because, you know, like curled up in bed being like, hoo, 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 my life is terrible. <laughs> so I sat up uh, because if I was going to have a conversation with someone, you know, someone I loved who was in my bed, I'd be sitting up and, you know, giving them, comforting them. Number four, try to offer reassurance while acknowledging their feelings. Imagine these feelings belong to someone else. What might you say? And so that was doing that. It's just so, it feels so fucking loving. Oh, so caring, so sweet. And you're doing it to yourself. You're saying, I understand. Oh my goodness. That sounds so difficult. And it makes sense that you feel like that. And oh, I'm so sorry you're having these experiences. It feels so nice. Well, it does, does for me anyway. Number five, get feedback. How does a part respond? Are you on the right track slash getting it? So that might not be, that might work for you. It might not work for you. But, but a lot of what I do is challenging, challenging thoughts that come up, right? Challenging thoughts of this is absolutely true and I should feel shame. Um, and talking to yourself or, you know, in any way that you want. And obviously this is not going to be practical any time that you have some negative thought come up. Most of the time you're just going to be like, whatever, it's true, you know. Um, but when you have the capacity to do this, um, kind of when I say curiosity, kind of if this happened to someone else, 
would you be agreeing and saying, oh God, yeah, you are a piece of shit? Or at the end of that, when I, um, when I finished that, and it, you know, it was probably two minutes, right? When I finished that last week, I, was, I felt angry. I felt angry for the person who had shamed me. It was a, one of the producers in, on the TV show. And I had been internalizing what he said and it was saying, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. And da, da, da. And, um, and I, then at the end of it, instead of feeling shame, I felt anger, which was great. Love a bit of anger. And I was just like, fuck that guy. Who the fuck is he to say that, you know, to make me feel ashamed for, for that and laughing at me and, and d- doing it for good telly? you know um and that it was a much nicer better place to be versus he was he was right i shouldn't have said that i should feel embarrassed and and then in my head um like a few days later i in my head i wrote him a, an email i didn't do it for real but i still might do it but in my head i wrote him an email saying do you know how much harm you caused when you did that what I'm talking about is um, there's this thing called master interview. And so uh, on the on the show, they'll have lots of different like short interviews with you. And um, and then towards the end of the show, they'll have a master interview where they I guess they ask all the questions that they haven't yet asked um, so that they can use footage of you like doing a uh, voiceover or, or, you know, whatever. Uh, and this is the, the place where they will push you push you, push you, push you, because it's, the end, it's towards the end of the show. If you walk off, they've still got the show in the can. They don't need to wor- worry about it. You know, it's kind of like if you see a documentary and you see like a, a, um, a journalist is with someone and, and they're, and the, you know, the, the, the idea is to expose them at the beginning. They're not going to be asking them the hard questions because they don't want them to storm off. Right. And at the end, then they'll go in because they've got nothing to lose, go in with the really hard questions and maybe the person will storm out and then that would make good TV. And so this master interview is so intense. It's one of the most intense things that I've experienced because you are looking looking at a mirror of the person's eyes. And so you're looking, you've got lights on you, um, the camera obviously, and then and then you're looking in directly into the camera lens, but then there's a mirror of the interviewer so that you'll you can see their eyes and so you just you know all these lights and you just see their eyes and then they're right in front of you physically but then you're kind of looking to the side but you're looking straight into the camera and um for I th- it was about two hours you know started with oh let's tell me about your life and and going over traumatic things and lucky because I've done so much therapy and all that stuff it's not, it's not so difficult for me to talk about but then not talking about it in a um, compassionate way and then going into more difficult things and then when I wouldn't want to talk about certain s- topics you know because he was being a, a dickhead I'd say let's not talk about that and and then he would come back to it seconds later and I'd be like, no, let's not talk about that and then he'd go again let's not talk about that and I didn't want to give them the satisfaction of me you know getting up and saying you know I'm done with this interview because then that would have made good tv I wanted uh, to just be as neutral as possible now I would have um just been like oh i just need to pop to the toilet and then would have just left you know and just like so they didn't get good tv of me me leaving or i would have just said loads of swear words so they couldn't use it that's another trick that, that you can use is just being like you know using the c word or something because they can't use that or just uh talking nonsense or something you know something that they couldn't use um anyway and so he would uh, asking he was asking me so many different questions to get a reaction from me and I'm I'm pretty I think I'm pretty level-headed and um because I've experienced so many different trolls on the internet there's not that many things are going to get a reaction and so he was doing his best but he didn't get a reaction from me which I bet he was so frustrated and because of that he was saying um you know, not inappropriate. Thing. Well, yes, because of the way he did it. But he wasn't being like, oh, yeah, your mum's a bitch or anything like that. But he was kind of like prodding at really personal things, you know. 
anyway so, so anyway that's what happens and so and so i was internalizing all that and being like oh yeah it's my fault and no it wasn't that was deeply inappropriate they did that the way that he did went about that was abusive and that is not okay and he has caused me harm because t- what two three years later i'm still ta- i'm still talking about it in therapy i'm still paying money to to get over this it is is experience and it wasn't just that two hour interview it was like uh the aftermath and everything that went on blah, blah, blah. Uh, so okay let's move on to how to self soothe i kind of feel like i'm saying that word self 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 soothe it's because it's got an f and a th on the soothe self soothe um so how you soothe yourself like you're soothing yourself if you do that process of talking to yourself and and acknowledging um your feelings and talking to yourself like a friend then you're you're soothing but but that not, might not be accessible to you in the moment and a lot of times people feel like doing things to soothe them or soothe themselves or to um avoid triggers is is not good because i have to face up to it but no you don't have to and so if you've got if if wearing certain clothes is making you feel uncomfortable wear different clothes wear baggier clothes wear clothes that hide areas that are triggering for you wear um things that make you feel good in in whatever way it is and so it could be being more physically comfortable wearing no hard no hard trousers only soft trousers only sweating pants only elastic waists whatever it is that makes you feel better so that you're not noticing the things that you might be struggling with okay um if mirrors are a problem cover them take them down you don't you don't have to force yourself to be exposed to a trigger to try and force yourself to get over it that's not really helpful right you know um maybe you can build up and do some exposure therapy but if right now you're really struggling it's okay to take down the mirrors to cover them up you know um be super protective with your mental health and what is allowed into your brain and so if you're struggling right now and you're having a hard time or if you're struggling and just like in a random moment when when shit goes down and then you know you have a bad day and then you think oh i feel bad it maybe it's not a great idea to go home and watch that netflix show that has a ton of normative bodies in maybe it's not a good idea to go on instagram and look at recipes from you know someone who's into quote unquote healthy food or whatever maybe it's not a good time to talk to your mum who's going to ask about going to tell you about her new diet you know so protect how you can and that's not always possible um but if there is something you can do there then that's great and what self care can you engage in is there anything that you can do for yourself um and the big thing is can you just catch the thought so that you know don't don't you know with these all these ideas i'm giving you don't don't feel like oh i'm just so bad because i i never i never catch the thought and i never i never do this and i never like don't make this another stick to beat yourself right if you can catch the thought of i'm feeling shame and then okay i'm feeling shame so what i'm going to do is i'm going to um i'm going to order takeout tonight because i can't be bothered to cook you know it could be as simple as that or shame is driving the bus and i'm going to call my friend who i like you know and it doesn't have to be a big deal or it could be like oh there's shame uh, i'm busy i'm just going to carry on with my rest of my day or what's probably going to happen uh, you know you feel shame and you just don't recognize it which is fine right <gasps> right because when i say it's fine it's cuz you're human right we're humans we can't expect ourselves to be these highly evolved beings 24 hours a day you know you know um okay so let's do a little summary let's do a little summary people say to me I keep going into spirals with my thoughts around weight and it's got worse now because I started intuitive eating or I've recovered from or I'm recovering from my eating disorder and I've gained weight. Some things to consider and some thoughts that I have on this is that first thing this is so hard it's so hard and it can be really painful to gain weight and I want to extend massive empathy towards you. It's a normal feeling to have if you gain weight um that you might have negative or distressing emotions around that. If you have gained weight then noticing it 
with your, you know, by observing your body in the mirror or noticing uh, new flesh uh, on your body can be very, very difficult. And when you first notice it and the aftermath of that first noticing is normally the most difficult time. And this is probably going to ease as you get used to what your body looks like and how things have changed. Often though, what I see is that weight gain is way more uh, noticeable to you versus to others, right? Gaining weight, unless you gain a lot of weight, then it's, people are probably not gonna, you know, stop you on the street and say, oh my God, what, you know, what has happened to you? You've gained so much weight it's probably going to be a bigger thing for you than it is for other people. And that's not to say sometimes we do gain a lot of weight and people do notice. And, um, and that is, that is difficult to deal with as well. So if you have gained a perceptible amount of weight where people will notice that you've gained weight, I just want a massive compassion. And even if it's just a small amount of weight, um, that still can be very, very difficult and distressing to deal with, but massive, massive compassion towards yourself. Um, and if we can work towards building resiliency around shame through curiosity and working out how you can self-soothe alongside unlearning fat phobia and weight bias that you've internalized and that is is hounding your thoughts so it's really nice to believe that we have control over our weight the reality is that we don't and and um if you have put on weight then your body probably needed it so from here what can you do to get curious about those thoughts are they true is it is it a reality that you are a bad person because you've put on weight what would you um, say to a friend who was going through the exact same things? And what can you do to soothe? What can you do to self-soothe? It could be wearing baggier clothes. It could be covering the mirrors in your house. It could be talking to a friend. It could be watching a funny show on Netflix, whatever it is. So sending big fatty love and hugs to you. Okay, so that is the end of our episode. Thank you for hanging out with me today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, your afternoon, your evening, and I will see you on the next episode. See you in a while, alligator. Thanks for listening to the episode. And if you feel ready to get serious about this work and want to know when the doors open to Fierce Fatty Academy, which is my signature program where I teach all about how to overcome your fat phobic beliefs and learn to love your fat body, then go to fiercefatty.com forward slash waitlist. Again, that is fiercefatty.com forward slash waitlist to get your name on the waitlist for when Fierce Fatty Academy, my signature program, opens. 